title of this episode is Does Deuteronomy 2868 prove that the original Israelites were black? When attempting to prove that the original Israelites were in fact black, most people or groups use Deuteronomy 2868 as a supporting verse. They claim that it categorically demonstrates that the verse can only be referring to black people. Most of these people use a KJV Bible, which is at least a good thing, so let's have a look at what it really says. Deuteronomy 2868 And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. They say that this verse refers to the transatlantic slave trade, where black people were taken from Africa by ships and taken to America, where they were sold unto their enemies as slaves. So they interpret the verse as such. Deuteronomy 28.68 And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt, slavery, in America, again with ships. Now this is literal ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again, which is Israel. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies, the white race, for bondmen and bondwomen, slaves, and no man shall buy you, redeem. Before we break down this verse and look at the understanding of what has been applied to its meaning, let's add some context. This verse is actually the end verse in a very long list of blessings and curses given by God through Moses for those that would enter into the promised land. I have a separate podcast dedicated to the full blessings and curses of Deuteronomy 28. So God had said that there would be blessings for the people who followed him in the land and curses for those who would not follow him. These blessings and curses were given before the Israelites had even set foot into the promised land, which was Israel. These were the blessings and curses that would befall the Israelites should they obey or disobey God while they were in the land that they had been promised. You can't simply take this one verse, impose your belief into it, and then say, see, this applies to one specific people, and that proves the point. If this one verse is going to be taken as evidence, then all the blessings and curses must be taken and applied to that people. Therefore, it would need to also be demonstrated that all the other curses and the blessings could be applied to black people and not to anyone else through color or any other determinate means such as a specific nation. But let's have a look at the verse itself, break it down, and examine the understanding that has been applied to it. Deuteronomy 28, 68, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt, slavery, or America, again. Now, Egypt has been taken figuratively as meaning slavery, and also means America. Egypt in Hebrew, however, does not mean slavery. There is not one verse in the Bible where Egypt in of itself means slavery. Egypt means the physical land or the people. The Hebrew word is Mitzrayim and means Egypt, the proper name of a territory or a people. Mizraim, who Egypt derives its name from, was the son of Ham, one of the three sons of Noah, Genesis 10.6, and the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, and Put and Canaan. Now a verse that is often used as support for taking Egypt as meaning slavery is Exodus 22. Exodus 22, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So it is claimed that bondage is being linked to Egypt, and so when Egypt is referred to, it actually means slavery. However, the verse doesn't actually do what it is claimed it does. It rather very clearly distinguishes between Egypt and bondage. While it is very true, that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Egypt is separated from slavery. There are two separate reference, Egypt and bondage. They were in bondage in Egypt. Both the word for Egypt, Mitzrayim, and the Hebrew word for bondage, Abadim, from the root word, Ibed, are used in this verse. When the word Egypt is used in the Bible, it always refers to the physical race or the people of Egypt, 
and never bondage. Bondage is referred to as bondage. Egypt is simply not used as meaning bondage. When God wanted to refer to Egypt and the bondage in Egypt, then both are referenced. If just Egypt is used, then it is not the reference to the bondage in Egypt, but the physical land or the people. Over and over, the Bible uses both Egypt and bondage together. Deuteronomy 5.6 I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Micah 6, four, For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Judges 6, eight, That the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Joshua 24.17 for the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. Jeremiah 34.13 Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying. The Israelites were brought out of slavery, but also out of the physical land of Egypt. It is possible to be brought out of slavery, but not removed from the physical land, and vice versa. The land of Egypt, the physical place of, is separated from the physical act of the bondage. Now another verse that is used is Hosea 9.3. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim, shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. The claim here is being that Ephraim, a reference to the northern kingdom of Israel, will go into Egypt, but then it states that they will eat unclean things in Assyria. Now this is a reference to the Assyrian captivity of 722 BC. Assyria is not Egypt. So we see that they didn't go into physical Egypt, but captivity in Assyria. And so it is asserted that Egypt is clearly a reference to captivity and not the physical land of Egypt. They would be in Egypt, slavery in Assyria. Now at first glance, this verse may appear to prove exactly what it is claimed it does. When we actually look at the verse, we will see that there are two separate prophecies here. Two separate references to two separate reference. One, that Ephraim will go back into Egypt. And those that go into Assyria would eat unclean things. This just means that the Israelites would not be allowed to follow their laws regarding food. The verse does not link Egypt to captivity. We cannot simply take this one verse and ignore all the other verses that very clearly distinguish between the physical land of Egypt and the physical bondage. The Bible tells us that it is by the mouth of two or three witnesses that a matter shall be established. Deuteronomy 19.15 One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. We can't take one passage or verse, and then use that passage to interpret the others. It has to be the other way around. If we have numerous passages saying one thing, which we do, we must use those passages to interpret the one that seems to be saying something different or contradictory. There are two explanations for the fulfilment of this verse. The first being the fact that Ephraim did go back into Egypt shortly before the Assyrian captivity. In fact, it was one of the reasons that the king of Assyria invaded Israel in the first place. The Israelites gave gifts to the king of Egypt. 2 Kings 17.1 In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hoshea, the son of Elah, to reign in Sumeria, over Israel, nine years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, and Hoshea, 
became his servant and gave him presents. And the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to the so king of Egypt and brought no present to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. In a prophecy in Isaiah, we see that the Lord will recover a remnant of his people. One of the places will be from Egypt, Isaiah 11.11. 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. Therefore, we see that Ephraim at some point must have gone back into physical Egypt. There is evidence that there was a remnant of Ephraim, the northern kingdom, that escaped the Assyrians and went to dwell in the southern kingdom. This is found in Second Chronicles 1, 1 through 11, but specifically verse 6. So the posts went with the letters from the king of his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return the remnant of you that escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. So, if there was a remnant of the northern kingdom living in the southern kingdom, then it is possible that when the Judeans fled into Egypt, when the Babylonians came against them in 597 BC, that some of those would have been from Ephraim, 2 Kings 25, 25. But it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, came, and ten men with him, and smote Gedaliah, and he died, and the Jews and the Chaldees that were with him at Mizpah, and all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the armies arose and came to Egypt, and they were afraid of the Chaldees. This is also told by Jeremiah in chapter 43, verse 6. Even men and women and children and the king's daughters and every prison that Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah and the son of Ahakim, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah the prophet and Baruch, the son of Neriah, so they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not to the voice of the Lord thus. So Ephraim had gone into Egypt, physical Egypt, and will be recovered from physical Egypt. These people or groups who are trying to make Egypt not only mean slavery, but specifically slavery in America, use Deuteronomy 28.49 as support. Deuteronomy 28.49 the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Here we have a reference to the eagle, and it is this that is used to link Egypt, or slavery, with America, the bold eagle being the national emblem of America. Now the verse, though, doesn't actually specifically refer to an emblem but rather the reference here is to the swiftness of an eagle as it flies. Now this is rather alluding to the speed of which the nation would come. However, it must also be stated that America is not the only country to have the eagle as its emblem. This includes, but is not limited to, Austria, Mexico, Poland, Romania, Russia and Indonesia. It must also be noted that the eagle was also the emblem of the Roman Empire, which is important when looking at the second part of this verse, with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee. It is far more likely that this curse was fulfilled throughout biblical times rather than some 3,000 years later. The Israelites were taken captive numerous times throughout history when God allowed them to be due to their falling away and not following him as recorded in the Old Testament. It is very likely that ships were used in their transportation. Even though Egypt is geographically close to Israel, it would not be an easy job to walk a group of captives through the desert to get from Israel to Egypt. It would be much easier to transport them 
via ships. There is another verse in Deuteronomy that is often used as additional support that verse 68 is referring to the transatlantic slave trade. Deuteronomy 28.48 Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. The verse states that they shall have a yoke of iron around their neck. It is very true that yokes around the neck were used on black people during the slave trade. However, it must be noted that they were not the first people to have yokes placed around their neck when taken into captivity. There are many images from ancient Egypt where slaves are depicted with yokes around their necks. The Romans also used yokes around the necks of slaves. Black people during the transatlantic slave trade were not the first people to have yokes placed around their necks when enslaved. To state otherwise is simply incorrect, either through ignorance or purposeful deception. This was almost certainly fulfilled during the Roman Jewish wars. We do know that the Israelites were taken from Israel to Egypt during the Roman Jewish wars and put in chains. Remember, the Roman emblem was also the eagle. So if the eagle must be a reference to the country that it represents, then the Roman Empire would fulfill that. Josephus wrote, Because the soldiers were now growing weary of bloodshed, and survivors appeared constantly, Caesar orders to kill only those who offered armed resistance, and to take alive all the rest. The troops, in addition to those covered by their orders, slaughtered aged and infirm, people to their prime who might be used they herded into the temple area and shut up the court of the women. Caesar appointed one of his freemen as their guard, his friend Fronto, to decide the fate appropriate to each. All those who had taken part in sedition and brigandage they informed against other, he executed. He picked out the tallest and handsomest of the lot and served them for the triumph. Of the rest, those who were over seventeen, he put in chains and sent to hard labour in Egypt, while great numbers were presented by Titus to the provinces to perish in the theatres by sword or by wild beast. Those under seventeen were sold. Josephus, The Jewish Wars, Book 6, 9-2 Munter, a Roman historian, wrote that the Israelites were sold unto their enemies However, due to the vast numbers, buyers could not be found for many of them, and they were not bought. Those who were not bought were taken to Egypt in ships. Now that Betar had been captured, everything came under human control, while Palestine, Judah, was reduced to a desolate mound. Captives were sold into slavery in numbers too great to count. First, they were brought to the grand annual market at the Terebinth Elah tree in Hebron, or in the words of Hieronymus, to the tent Ahol of Abraham near Hebron. Each slave sold for the price of a horse. Those captives who were not sold there were brought to the marketplace in Azza, which, because of the great multitudes of slaves who were sold there, was called Hadrian's Marketplace, and those who were still not sold there were herded into ships and were taken to Egypt. Many died in transit, whether by starvation or by shipwreck, while many also were killed by cruel masters. This is actually a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 11, Daniel 11.30. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Daniel in his vision saw the abomination of desolation, the destruction of the temple which occurred in 70 AD. They would be taken by Chittim by ships. So it would be worth finding out who Chittim was. Chittim was the son of Javan, Genesis 10.4, and the sons of Javan, Elisha and Tarshish, Kittim and Dodaknem. Javan was the son of Japheth.
Genesis 10 too. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshech and Tiraz. The Bible very clearly predicts the temple destruction and states that it would be Chittim that would take the Jews into captivity via ships, which we saw was done, and they went into physical Egypt. Notice what it states in verse 52, Deuteronomy 28, 52. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. In all thy gates, their gates, the gates of their land. Very clearly this could only be fulfilled while the Jews were in their own land, within the protection of their own high walls and gates, of which they trusted for protection. How can the transatlantic slave trade be a fulfilment of this when the people taken as slaves were taken from Africa? Africa was not the land of the Israelites. The Israelites would not have been besieged in their own land would not have been entrusting in their own high walls and high gates. The Israelites had already left their land and had not returned to it by the time of the transatlantic slave trade. So either this prophecy must have been fulfilled before or at the time the Israelites left their land in 70 AD, or it is a prophecy that will be fulfilled at some point in the future, after the Israelites return to their land. Unless it is a future prophecy not yet fulfilled, then Chittim can only be the Romans, and the Romans were not Esau. But the Romans were white, yes, but they were white through the son of Japheth. Either way, it certainly could not be fulfilled during the transatlantic slave trade. This was, however, fulfilled in 722 BC during the Assyrian captivity, in 597 BC during the Babylonian captivity and in the 3rd century BC when each time the Jews were taken from their own land behind the protection of their own walls and their own gates. To simply apply a historical act which has a similarity to a biblical verse taken at face value without any application or understanding to it and then make that biblical verse taken at face value without any application of understanding to it and make it mean the historical act based on that similarity is to twist and distort the biblical verse to make it appear to say something that it in fact doesn't. However, let's say that this was not fulfilled during the Roman Jewish War. There are still a few more problems that remain to simply assert that the transatlantic slave trade was a fulfillment of this verse. First of all, the slave trade of people from America actually started much earlier than those who were transported to America, in 1441 to be precise. This being some 50 years before America was even discovered. There have been many incidents of slavery that have involved the transportation of those people by the way of ships. The Barbary slave trade, for example, where white Europeans from places such as Italy, Spain, Portugal, France and England were taken to North Africa and sold as slaves between the 15th and the 19th centuries. The estimated figures are as high as 1.25 million, but this has been disputed. There was also the Slavic slave trade. Between 1500 and 1650, an estimated 1.5 million Eastern Europeans were taken to North Africa, the Middle East and Asia, while over a million were taken from Western Europe between 1530 and 1780. So there have been other historical occurrences of slaves being taken by ship. Another problem by saying that the transatlantic slave trade of black people is the fulfillment of this verse is that circular reasoning needs to be invoked. If all other occurrences of slaves being transported by ships are rejected, and only the transatlantic slave trade is accepted, then it would already need to be believed that black people are the Israelites for this to be a fulfillment of the verse. However, it would also then have to be believed that the transatlantic slave trade fulfills the scripture for it to support the Israelites are black. A very basic appeal to circular reasoning 
which does not prove anything. If the verse was not fulfilled during biblical times or by any previous slave shipment which the Hebrew Israelites will state, then there is no reason, unless you have already accepted that the Israelites are black, to assume that this verse has indeed yet been fulfilled. If we cannot point to the fulfillment of this verse at any time, if we don't presuppose that the Israelites are black, then it is just as viable to state that the verse has not yet been fulfilled, but will be fulfilled at a future time when the actual Israelites are back in their land. It also states in verse 53 that they would eat their own children. Deuteronomy 28.53 And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons, and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege, and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. Josephus wrote, Famine gnawed at the vitals, and the fire of rage was ever fiercer than famine. So, driven by fury and want, she committed a crime against nature. Seizing her child, an infant, at the breast, she cried, My poor baby, why should I keep you alive in this world of war and famine? Even if we live till the Romans come, they will make slaves of us. And anyway, hunger will get us before slavery does. And the rebels are crueler than both. Come, be food for me, and an avenging fury to the rebels, and a tale of cold horror to the world to complete the monstrous agony of the Jews. With these words, she killed her son, roasted the body, swallowed half of it, and stored the rest of it in a safe place. Now let's look at Thou shalt see it no more again. Let's look at the land that they would not see again, which is stated in reference to being Israel. Thou shalt see it no more again. Firstly, we cannot simply take this one section of the verse and isolate it. This is in continuation of the previous part of the verse, Deuteronomy 28.68, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it, it no more again. There is no reference to Israel in this verse, but Egypt. God had told the Israelites that they would not see Egypt again, if they had followed him. To input Israel as the place that they would not see again is to ignore the context of the verse and the very clear reference to Egypt. It was Egypt that God said that they would not see again, not Israel. Exodus 13, 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will shew to you today. For the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Deuteronomy 17.16 But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Jeremiah 42.19 The Lord hath said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt, know certainly that I have admonished you this day. The transatlantic slave trade did not take Israelites from Israel to America, but Africans from Africa to America. This leads us to the final part of the verse. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Now here it is asserted that this means the black Israelites would be sold as slaves, and that no man could redeem them. However, the Hebrew word used no man shall buy you is kana, which means to buy, or to purchase, to acquire. It does not mean to redeem. Redeem has its own word, para, to redeem or to ransom. The verse actually means what it actually states. They will be sold to their enemies to be slaves. However, they will not be bought. This means they literally will not be bought, not that they will not be redeemed. Black people were bought in the transatlantic slave trade. Many black people were also purchased or redeemed 
out of that slavery. The JPS Tanakh 1917 translates the verse as Deuteronomy 28.68 And the Lord shall bring thee back into Egypt in ships, by the way whereof I said unto thee, Thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall sell yourselves unto your enemies for bondmen and for bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. This translation would have the meaning that the Israelites would try to sell themselves as slaves, but nobody would buy them, which would have been an ultimate insult. This was again fulfilled during the Roman Jewish Wars, when there were so many Jews taken as slaves that buyers could not be found for all of them. Under proper and full scrutiny and analysis, the verse does not support the claim that the original Jews were black. Thank you very much for listening to the Following Truth podcast. I hope the information has been useful and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Please remember to subscribe and to give this podcast a thumbs up.